What are some of the dumbest decisions that people will make? Let's find out, starting with... Number 7. Cash Only In Colombia, a 67-year-old man found himself in need of surgery after swallowing over three dozen rolls of cash. Complaining of vomiting, nausea, and extreme constipation for over a month, the man admitted to ingesting 30 latex-covered capsules filled with cash, with only 20 being expelled naturally. Upon examination, the doctors discovered that the compact masses of paper currency had become wedged in the man's stomach, making it impossible to extract them through the throat. Diagnosed with pyloric stenosis, a condition typically seen in infants, the patient had a tightened valve connecting the stomach and small intestine, restricting the passage of food. Facing a unique surgical challenge, doctors opted for laparoscopic surgery, creating a small incision near the affected area to remove the rolls of cash. The procedure was successful, and the man was discharged 18 hours later, showing no long-term ill effects. The motive behind the man's decision to ingest the cash remains unclear but speculation suggests he might have been a mule transporting illegal money across borders. In the world of trafficking, mules often hide things in various ways, including swallowing them. Colombia is known for being a significant player in that specific global trade, being the largest producer of nose beers worldwide. That, and contributing to many pointless late nights having to listen to pointless rants for certain unfortunate people. Anyways. It seems this was a plan without an exit plan, because in this bizarre scenario, the man's decision to swallow rolls of cash raises questions about the lack of foresight in executing such a risky plan, whether driven by desperation, coercion, or a misguided sense of strategy, the man found himself in a precarious situation that required medical attention. For the little cherry on top, the hospital reported that the money was unusable post-surgery. While the man's health was preserved, his financial scheme ended up in a literal stomachache. Number 6. The Prettiest Cops A group of female NYPD officers got in trouble when photos of them in uniform appeared on a provocative Instagram account. The officers allegedly violated the department's social media policy by posting pictures of themselves in uniform away from official ceremonies. The photos, featured on platforms like Blue Line Beauties, dedicated to law enforcement women, showcase officers posing both on and off duty. The images, submitted by officers wanting to be featured on the profile, depict a variety of scenarios, from a policewoman with a Santa badge above her uniform to selfies flaunting cleavage and night out preparations. Sharing such images violates NYPD regulations, which prohibit officers from taking and posting uniform pictures online unless at official events. The NYPD implemented social media guidelines in 2013, emphasizing the importance of officers exercising good judgment and professionalism online. The department stressed that personal social media sites could impact credibility, interfere with official police business, compromise investigations, and affect employment status. Disciplinary actions for breaching these guidelines range from the loss of vacation days to termination from the force. In this case, sources suggest that the female officers involved may face a vacation day penalty of up to 10 days. The incident echoes a previous investigation into NYPD officers posing with patrol cars and motorcycles on dating profiles. The NYPD deputy commissioner said that posting uniform photos photos without authorization aims to protect officers from revealing potentially compromising information on social media. So what do you think? Were sharing these alluring photos a bad decision? Or were these cops simply exercising their right to express themselves? Number 5. Robbing Peter, Robbing Paul In Colorado, a group of really slick armed robbers found themselves at the mercy of a car thief who managed to steal their getaway vehicle right from under their noses. The scene unfolded at the high-low check cashing business in Commerce City, where three masked individuals were attempting an armed robbery. The security cameras captured the robber's black car, with magenta tape on one of the black windows, circling the parking lot before parking. As fate would have it, the criminals made a critical error they forgot to lock their own getaway vehicle. Seizing the opportunity, another keen-eyed thief jumped into the car and sped away, leaving the robbers without a getaway car. The Commerce City Police Department humorously acknowledged the situation on Facebook. While the
while the armed robbers had to resort to fleeing on foot, the police managed to apprehend two of them, revealing them to be teenagers aged 14 and 15. Loaded firearms were found in their possession. The stolen getaway car, believed to be an already stolen Kia, added another layer of irony to the situation. As for the unidentified car thief, the police posted a message that said that they'd like to shake the car thief's hand, then arrest them for stealing cars. Ultimately, we can't help but wonder why the getaway driver needed to get out of the car and go inside to begin with. So unprofessional. Number four, not Oscar worthy. In a strange case of insurance fraud, a New Jersey man, Alexander Goldinsky, was caught on camera orchestrating a fake slip and fall incident at a company cafeteria. The incident involved Goldinsky deliberately spilling a cup of ice onto the floor before theatrically lying down and waiting to be discovered. Goldinsky, an independent contractor working for All Gold Industries, what a crazy name coincidence, right? Was subcontracted for work at the business where the fall was staged. Surveillance footage captured him filling a cup with ice from a soda machine, tossing the ice onto the floor, and then carefully positioning himself as if he had slipped. Following the orchestrated fall, Goldinsky filed insurance claims for an ambulance ride and treatment for injuries supposedly sustained during the fall. The surveillance video, however, revealed the entire charade, leading to Goldinsky's arrest. He faced charges of third-degree insurance fraud and third-degree theft by deception. Goldinsky eventually pleaded guilty to third-degree insurance fraud, and he was sentenced to two years of probation and 14 hours of community service. Additionally, he was ordered to pay $563 in restitution to to the health insurance company. The case was part of a statewide crackdown on insurance fraud by the New Jersey Attorney General's office. If you didn't know, faking a fall is really stupid, and faking it in front of a camera is even dumber. Like, way more stupid. Especially when the evidence is as clear as ice on the floor. It's safe to say Goldinsky's attempt at a slippery insurance scam didn't land on solid ground. Shouldn't he at least look around to see if there were cameras? Since he probably lost his job due to his bad acting, he should change his name to to fake trip and ski, or oops, dropped ice on the floor, hope I don't fall and ski, or eh, you know, whatever. Number three, hind brain activity. A trio of young women, including Acacia Friedman, who was previously pictured cozying up to Bill Clinton at a Hillary rally, found themselves mixed up in legal troubles. Friedman, alongside University of Miami students Maori Noun and Samara Charlton, faced arrests after a sting at a luxurious hotel. Noun allegedly played a role in setting up dates for Friedman and Charlton to an undercover police officer at the Four Star Colonnade Hotel in Miami. During the sting operation, Noun allegedly in negotiated a price for, uh, let's call it some fun times in their birthday suits, asking for more than the $8,000 initially offered. The police arrested Friedman and Charlatan as they arrived at the upscale hotel while Noun was detained separately. Interestingly, Acacia Friedman's previous connection to Bill Clinton was highlighted when a photo of her posing with the former president surfaced. The image, posted on her now-deleted Twitter page, added a layer of intrigue to the story. The date of the photo was unclear, but Clinton's campaign Pin suggested it might have been during Hillary's presidential campaign between August 2015 and November 2016. Eventually, Maori Noun reached a plea deal, agreeing to undergo rehab, serve two years of house arrest, and two years of probation. There have been no further reports of the trio getting involved in any more criminal activities, so it seems that this legal intervention may have been a blessing in disguise. Number two, excuse the hindbrain again. In Caesar's Palace on the Vegas Strip, a man's stroke of luck at a blackjack table quickly turned into a tale of misfortune. After winning $125,000, the unnamed man found himself at the center of a heist allegedly orchestrated by two women, Karina Singleton and Maria Vanderwall who were accused of executing a trick roll. The incident unfolded after the man, attending a conference at the hotel, cashed out his winnings from a blackjack game. In a plot reminiscent of a casino caper movie, the man ran into Singleton and Vanderwall in the casino, but somehow he doesn't recall inviting them to his room. Right. Now, we can only speculate about the gentleman's reasons for inviting the women upstairs, probably to talk about video games or discuss politics in the Balkans, circa 1918. Actually, Actually, it was probably for Bible study. Yes, that must have been what it was. Regardless, the man's conveniently hazy memory led to a rude awakening.
awakening as he later woke up to find his hard-earned $125,000 in cash and a $20,000 Rolex missing. The women, who spent approximately 15 minutes in the man's room, were captured on surveillance cameras exiting the hotel and making their way to the valet at the nearby Bellagio. From there, they hopped into a black SUV before returning to Caesar's Palace. The caper continued as parking garage cameras showed the duo rendezvousing with a white BMW, with Vanderwall reportedly flaunting a distinctive leopard print tattoo. Photos from another parking garage helped identify Singleton. The police tracked down their vehicles to homes in the greater Las Vegas area, leading to the arrests of the alleged culprits. Singleton, with a history of multiple arrests, faces an additional charge of conspiracy to commit grand larceny, while Vanderwall is charged with residential burglary in addition to larceny charges. The dumb decision here was the man's choice to win a substantial amount of cash, flaunt it, and then invite individuals renowned for their questionable morals. Sometimes it's best to savor a victory quietly, especially in a city known for its high-stakes escapades. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out about the people who completely lied about who they are. Number 1. Fake Cop Busted Carl Colston Jr. from Maryland found himself on the wrong side of the law after an elaborate attempt to impersonate a cop. Colston's vigilante campaign involved him buying law enforcement gear and weapons, resulting in his arrest for impersonating a police officer. The unraveling of Colston's scheme began when the real police responded to a report of an armed individual in a Crown Victoria driving erratically on an off-ramp. The suspect, later identified as Colston, was reportedly honking and flashing white interior lights. When a victim waved to let the car pass, Colston allegedly pulled up alongside, flashed a badge, and forced the second driver to stop. Mimicking a police officer, he attempted a traffic stop, grabbing a tactical vest, displaying a badge, and claiming to be the police while calling for backup on a handheld radio. Colston then revealed that he was packing, although he didn't point it at the victim, but lifted it for visibility. The victim, quick on his feet, told Colston he was recording the incident and calling the real police. So Colston ran back to his Crown Victoria, where he sped away. An arrest warrant was issued, and ironically, Colston was apprehended during a routine traffic stop later in the week, taken into custody without incident. After further investigation, police discovered a cache of police and tactical equipment in Colston's possession, raising questions about how he obtained such gear. No one really knows why Colston wanted to pretend to be a cop, but we can guess the guy probably wanted to join the force but couldn't make the cut. In the age of advanced technology, real-time verification of an individual's law enforcement status can be easily conducted by authorities. Attempting to impersonate a police officer without hacking into police systems is just a bad idea all around. It's not a good idea to pretend to be a cop anyway, but if you're going to do it, you have to at least try to cover your tracks, right? This dude was literally flashing his interior lights at the guy he pulled over. Who are some of the fakest people out there who misrepresent exactly who they are. Today's entry about George Santos was suggested by Winged Unicorn 500. If you would ever like us to cover anyone or a specific topic, you can either email us at pablitosway2016 at gmail.com or leave a comment within 24 hours of the release of our latest video. Let's get started with... Number 6. The Creepy Party Crasher Notorious New York party crasher Priantha De Silva gained entry to high society events through imaginative frauds and pretending to be someone he was not. De Silva infiltrated events by posing as an affluent man about town, a high-powered editor, and an influential movie producer. He would attend events in Manhattan and tell people he was a producer for Oscar-winning movies like Slumdog Millionaire and Crash. De Silva attended many high-profile events like the movie premieres of Stockholm and Jonathan and parties for The Tourist and Blue Valentine. When De Silva attended Polaroid's 80th anniversary bash, he spent his evening pretending to be an Oscar-winning producer and creeping out a group of young fashionistas, which seems to be a regular thing for him. He bragged about writing for Lady Gaga and claimed he won several Oscars for Best Picture. But De Silva had a secret. He was broke and went to extreme measures to hide it. In 2010, De Silva talked his way into a charity dinner put on by the young philanthropists of the Cancer Research Institute by acting shocked he wasn't on the guest list. 
De Silva claimed his check must have gotten lost in the mail and gave his credit card number instead. There was a silent auction at the event where De Silva purchased a $1,500 Prada bag, which he also charged to the credit card number he provided at the door. When the event staff ran the card number he provided later, it declined, and it turned out he had used a fake Bank of America credit card. De Silva was arrested over the incident and pleaded guilty to fourth-degree grand larceny, resulting in a two-and-a-half to a three-year prison sentence. Apparently, he was upset that being locked up meant he would miss fashion. After completing his sentence, De Silva was released from prison and back to his old ways. In May 2013, he deposited five credit card convenience checks into someone else's account, then withdrew roughly $15,000 that didn't belong to him. A few months later, he deposited a check for $19,985, which was supposedly issued and signed by Contessa Garzadori into his Citibank account. The NYPD was notified when he attempted to withdraw $12,500 the following day. Police went through De Silva's bag, where they found a bank statement and a check belonging to Garzadori, the driver's license of Justin Adams, and other documents belonging to various people. Officers arrested De Silva, and he was again charged with grand larceny. He pleaded guilty guilty to the grand larceny charge and criminal possession of a forged instrument. This time, his sentence was 30 months to five years. De Silva did his time, but refused to learn his lesson. Well, he is consistent. De Silva deposited $4,275 in checks made out to him from Artisan Russian Dumpling, LLC, the legal name for Dal Dumplings, an Upper West Side shop. He used another fake check from Artisan Russian Dumpling, LLC, to buy a ticket to the Tribeca Film Festival. De Silva emailed the film festival to purchase VIP tickets, but the check bounced. In 2018, he was arrested again, and this time charged with stealing property from the film festival. Officers found him at a homeless shelter where he had been living the whole time. De Silva is now serving two to four years at a facility in upstate New York. If he tries to float some of his lies in prison, he could be in for some real trouble. Number five, actual cultural misappropriation. Kay LeClaire, a Wisconsin-based artist, shared their intricate bead and basket work on social media and Etsy. LeClaire identified as non-binary and Native American, building a following over two years with their artwork. That was until the actual creators of the work came forward to take ownership of the pieces and accused LeClaire of taking credit for other people's crafts and stories. In their posts, LeClaire claimed they took inspiration from visions and dreams. LeClaire claimed multiple identities, including two-spirit, which is a term indigenous people often use to describe a person with non-binary gender identity. Additionally, LeClaire claimed multiple multiple ethnic identities, including Native American, Métis, Onida, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Cuban, and Jewish. She was actually none of these. But not even being a little bit indigenous didn't stop LeClaire from pretending, though, as they campaigned for civil rights for indigenous people and would write academic papers and speak at conferences to raise awareness about indigenous issues. One of the articles they wrote was about a white-owned music venue opening in Madison called Winnebago, the name for a local tribe, which indigenous people saw as a slur. LeClaire created art work, and by created, we mean stealing. And when discussing their inspiration, LeClaire would either make up stories or steal other people's stories. LeClaire also claimed to have worked on tanning animal hides. They hadn't. LeClaire contacted John Greendeer, the health and wellness coordinator at the Ho-Chunk Nation, to see if he had any scraps of hide to use on an art project. Greendeer was quickly suspicious of LeClaire and suspected they were lying about their abilities and history. But because of the warm and welcoming nature of the tribe, very few even questioned question LeClaire, simply accepting what they said at face value. LeClaire took an active role in the Native American community and became deeply ingrained. They co-founded a queer indigenous artist collective, the Gige Collective, where they spoke about issues of importance to the tribal communities in the state. LeClaire was even appointed to serve on Wisconsin's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Task Force. LeClaire was named the first community leader in residence at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Ecology, which paid $4,800 for the role. Nipponent Lansom, the co-founder of Gige Collective, noticed LeClaire would frequently not show up for work. The opinion of the collective was that LeClaire was financially draining them, as they were paying LeClaire $750 a week to not show 
up. Some community members were suspicious of Leclerc's indigenous claims, but tried to give her the benefit of the doubt. Even before the truth of Leclerc's identity came to light, executives at the Guiche Collective planned to remove Leclerc as an owner. Lansom always had suspicions about Leclerc, who would ask her to take them to the tanning salon as Leclerc claimed to have a vitamin D deficiency. Leclerc also always carried a bottle of spray tan, which is really weird the more you think about it. How is that even explained? Leclerc also frequently made inaccurate statements about Mady's culture, which Lansom noticed and found strange. She found some old photos on Leclerc's social media pages where Leclerc had fair skin and light hair. However, as colonialism left many indigenous people disconnected from their cultures, Lansom assumed Leclerc struggled to define their indigenous ancestry. Advanced Smite, a hobbyist genealogist, decided to do more digging into Leclerc's background. He learned of them through a Facebook ad for an upcoming talk they were giving about indigenous feminism. As it turns out, Advanced Smite had some talking to do as well. Advanced Smite had noticed inconsistencies in Leclerc's stories, such as their native name, a name typically used in ceremonies or with other people in the community. Through his investigations, he found that Leclerc was a common Native American last name, but they claimed to be Anishinaabe in social media posts. He discovered through Leclerc's social media that they had claimed to be Cuban in the past, and in a Facebook post from 2017, they identified as white. The genealogist then traced Leclerc's true lineage, which was German, Swedish, and French Canadian. Advanced Smite ultimately revealed Leclerc's true identity. They went by Katie Leclerc in 2012 and graduated from Hamilton High School in Sussex, Wisconsin. Leclerc married their high school alum, Adam Pagenkopf, in the summer of 2018. People immediately believed Advanced Smite's findings, having dealt with inconsistencies in Leclerc's stories for years. The Guiche Collective removed Leclerc from ownership and contacted a lawyer to handle further conversations with them. They publicly stated how Leclerc's actions hurt the organization and its members from a personal, professional, and financial standpoint. Leclerc issued a half-hearted apology where they acknowledged their actions and promised to return any culturally related items in their possession to the community. Their apology wasn't well received, as the indigenous community felt she had done too much damage to reconcile. What's the indigenous name for phony baloney? Number four, the wine entrepreneur. Former Shark Tank entrepreneur Joseph Falcone raised almost $2 million intended for his business, but put the money towards personal expenses instead. The $2 million bucks Falcone raised from investors should have put his business in an excellent position to grow, but he had a different plan for the money. He used over half a million dollars to pay his personal bills, such as the mortgage on his Florida home, and to fund his online securities trading. Falcone appeared on Shark Tank to present his wine in a cup idea, which was a single serving of wine in a sealed glass. After the successful pitch, he established 3G's Vino LLC in 2012. It was a wine and liquor distribution business based in Bethpage and Farmingdale, New York. After being featured on Shark Tank, Falcone used the TV cameo to persuade investors to put more money into the product. Between September 2014 and November 2015, he persuaded investors to hand over $1.8 million to produce the single serving wine product. He then decided he had better ways to spend that money. The company that made the product, Copa de Vino, had no involvement in Falcone scheme. Their founder, James Martin, clarified that Falcone didn't pitch Copa de Vino on Shark Tank and had never been an investor in the product. Copa de Vino was strictly a 3G's Vino LLC distributor and severed ties with the distribution company and Falcone in 2016. Falcone's pretending to be an entrepreneur and winemaker failed. He pleaded guilty to wire fraud and was sentenced to 24 months in prison. The judge also ordered that he pay $1.8 million in restitution to seven of the investors he deceived. That'll be something to whine about. Out. Number three, school dinner scam. Alozer Porges and Joel Lowey ran the Central United Talmudical Academy, but this duo proved that not all individuals in power are as holy as they seem. Porges and Lowey were the former leaders of a Brooklyn school that was supposed to be serving federally subsidized suppers five nights a week to low-income and at-risk children. Many children already received federally funded breakfasts, lunches, and snacks at school. However, school was dismissed at 4.45 and the children went home without supper. Porges and Lowey lied in documents claiming schools served these children dinner. They dramatically inflated the number of meals the schools provided to receive larger reimbursements from the federal government's child and adult food program designated for at-risk and vulnerable children. Porges and Lowey then used the funds to throw social events for adults, bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs in a nearby banquet hall. Their expenditures included $800,000 on just chicken, not even Popeye's chicken, which would make some sense, but regular chicken. The FBI discovered the school had carried out multiple frauds to cheat the government, including 
including diverting over $3 million allocated for school children's meals and other uses. The school admitted to defrauding the government, and Lowey and Porges pleaded guilty to fraud charges. The Central United Talmudical Academy received over $3.2 million in federal meal reimbursement programs in 2014 and 2015. Investigators realized the program never existed, and the school was putting the money to other uses. But that wasn't the school's only scheme to defraud the government of millions of dollars. The school also manipulated a payroll to hide employee income by paying workers in cash and coupons for local stores. Additionally, the school contrived tax exemptions, received technology funding unrelated to education, provided childcare without licenses, and engaged in other fraudulent activities. Porges received a two-year prison sentence and a fine of $150,000. His attorneys argued he should only receive community service rather than prison time as he had to care for his family. A fair point. However, prosecutors revealed that Porges left his wife with their 11 children and gave her a meager $250 per week allowance, prompting her to apply for food stamps. Number two, George Santos. Richard Osthoff is a disabled veteran whose dog needed surgery when Long Island Republican George Santos offered to help raise funds for the operation. The seemingly selfless act should have saved Osthoff's dog's life. Instead, the money just disappeared. Osthoff was living in a tent in an abandoned chicken coop in Howell, New Jersey with his service dog, Sapphire. In May 2016, Sapphire developed a life-threatening stomach tumor which Osthoff couldn't afford to treat. After the devastating diagnosis, a veterinary technician told Osthoff about the charity Friends of Pets United and Anthony DeVolder, a man who could help. George Santos used the name Anthony DeVolder as an alias when he first entered politics. At first, Santos appeared touched by Osthoff's story and wanted to help. He raised $3,000 on social media using a GoFundMe page. Then, the page was unexpectedly shut down. Without the $3,000, Osthoff had no way to get Sapphire the treatment she needed. When retired police sergeant Michael Bowl heard what happened, he intervened in an attempt to get the money back. Sapphire's condition worsened. Osthoff couldn't even pay for the dog euthanasia and cremation, having been out of work for over a year with a broken leg and had a panhandle to raise the money. Bull confronted Santos and demanded he give Ostoff the cash or use it to get Ostoff another service dog. Santos was uncooperative on the phone and claimed he would use the money to help other animals instead. The politician added that Ostoff didn't do things the way he wanted and that Sapphire was not a candidate for surgery, meaning the funds should go to another animal in need. Bull pointed out that the money was specially raised for Ostoff and his service dog, but Santos wouldn't budge. Sapphire was also supposed to be the beneficiary of a 2017 fundraising event in which Santos charged $50 a person, but Ostoff never received a dime. When Santos was asked about Ostoff's claims, he denied ever even knowing the veteran. Ostoff did a TV interview where he called Santos out for being a fraud and keeping the donations raised for him and Sapphire. The attention Ostoff's situation raised meant that people were looking deeper into Santos's charity, with him facing allegations of not just stealing the $3,000, but also running a fake charity. His colleagues in the New York State Assembly and Senate and local Democratic organizations have called for his resignation. Also, both the New York State Democratic Committee and the Nassau County Democratic Committee called for an investigation into his behavior. Sapphire passed away on January 15, 2017. George Santos is somehow still in office. Number one, what kind of a dealer? Australian jewelry designer Gene Wimmer once lived an extravagant lifestyle until authorities discovered he was actually running a $5 million um, illegal substances ring. To the outside world, Wimmer lived a life filled with glittering diamond, flashy sports cars, a gold-plated Harley Davidson, and front row seats to Sydney Harbour fireworks display. Wimmer often took to Instagram to share his life with his glamorous girlfriend and to post photos of his diamond-encrusted jewelry creation. While he was bragging on social media, Tasmanian police had partnered with New South Wales authorities and the Australian Federal Police's National Anti-Gang Squad to reveal the truth about Wimmer and how he got his money. And it wasn't from selling jewelry. Wimmer had been running his business from his Sydney home for two years, which involved smuggling large quantities of illegal substances into Tasmania by air, sea, and human couriers. Police executed search warrants where they seized four luxury vehicles, a motorcycle valued at $2 million, and cash. They released footage of them seizing and towing the vehicles from Wimmer's home. Wimmer was arrested and charged with trafficking offenses and was extradited from Australia to Tasmania. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather have, free healthcare for life or free car insurance for life.